Right now on Morning News Now, confrontation and escalation in the Red Sea. This morning, tension rising after a ballistic missile and drone attack involving a U.S. Navy destroyer and Iranian-backed militants. And Israel expanding its ground assault on Gaza, pushing into the south after talks to restore a ceasefire with Hamas collapse. Unfortunately, the negotiations have stopped. That said, what hasn't stopped is our own involvement trying to get those back on track. All this as dozens of hostages remain in captivity in Gaza. We have team coverage. Also this morning, chaos on Capitol Hill as expelled Congressman George Santos threatens to file ethics complaints against his former colleagues. And House lawmakers get ready to vote on a possible impeachment inquiry into President Biden. We will bring you the latest. Plus, December off to a stormy start as a series of storms stretch from coast to coast. We are tracking the conditions, including the areas most at risk for dangerous flash flooding. And a kiss goodbye. That's right. Legendary rock band Kiss says they've closed the curtain after one final show. or on their decades of rock, the Kiss area, and why some fans wonder if this is really the end. And so how often do we hear major Those artists say they're done and then yeah. they come back? You I know, and they get know. a little surge. And, exactly. And they never or go Perhaps anywhere. it is sealed with a kiss. We'll yeah. find out. Right. There Good you morning. Go. Good to have you with us on this Monday. I'm Joe Fryer. And I'm Savannah Sellers. We're going to begin this morning with the latest in Gaza. The Israeli military is widening operations after that ceasefire ended late last week. Defense forces issued evacuation orders to people living in southern in Gaza. The move has prompted new fears and mass confusion for those who were told to escape the north and head south just weeks ago. Israel also withdrew its negotiators from Qatar over the weekend, leaving an uncertain future for the nearly 140 hostages remaining in Gaza. A senior Hamas official says no additional hostages will be released until another ceasefire agreement is reached. The Hamas-run health ministry in Gaza says at least 700 people have been killed since the air strikes resumed on Friday. Israel's Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu vowed to continue the ongoing bombardment of Gaza until, quote, we achieve all of our goals. But U.S. officials are intensifying their calls for Israel to protect civilian lives. That includes U.S. Defense Secretary Lloyd Austin speaking over the weekend at a defense forum. This kind of a fight, the center of gravity is the civilian population. And if you drive them into the arms of the enemy, you replace a tactical victory with a strategic defeat. So I have repeatedly made clear to Israel's leaders that protecting Palestinian civilians in Gaza is both a moral responsibility and a strategic imperative. We have our team standing by to break down the latest in Gaza, including analysis from Lieutenant Colonel Daniel Davis and more on the hostages from Dr. Haggai Levine. We begin with NBC News foreign correspondent Raf Sanchez, who once again is in Tel Aviv. Raf, good morning. So walk us through what we are seeing on the ground since the ceasefire ended late last week, including how Israel is now expanding its offensive into southern Gaza. Joe, good morning. I'm looking over my shoulder because we're hearing booms overhead, which is a possible sign of fresh rocket fire coming out of Gaza. The Israeli military says it is operating now in every part of the Gaza Strip after launching a new ground offensive into the south. Now, we saw this focus on the south beginning just minutes, really, after the ceasefire collapsed on Friday morning. It started with a punishing set of airstrikes, and now Israeli ground forces, tanks, and troops are operating inside of southern Gaza. And the head of the Israeli military says the assault on the south will be just as ferocious as the assault we saw on the north. Remember, satellite imagery shows half the buildings in northern Gaza have either been partly or completely destroyed. Israel says it will move in the same way in the south. A lot of the focus right now is on the city of Han Yunus in southern Gaza. Israel says that is where Hamas's leaders are hiding after fleeing, Ga fleeing Gaza City. But it is also where hundreds of thousands of Palestinian civilians who left the north fled to, hoping to find shelter. Guys. Yeah, Raf, so what does that mean now for those people? Where do Palestinians go now? Is there anywhere safe? And is the U.S. doing anything to try to urge there to be safe spaces? 
Yeah, Savannah, what we are hearing consistently from Palestinian civilians is they feel they have nowhere left to run. Weeks ago, Israel was telling them, if you leave the north, if you go to the south, you will be safe down there. Now Israel is telling them you need to get out of cities like Han Yunus because they are preparing to attack there. The Israeli military, since the collapse of the ceasefire, has released this grid map of Gaza. It divides Gaza into 2,400 squares. It says it's doing that to help Palestinian civilians get out of harm's way. But what we, we're hearing from people is that this map is actually just causing a lot of fear, a lot of confusion. People know where Israel is going to strike, but they have absolutely no idea where they're supposed to go. And as you heard from Vice President Harris, from Secretary of Defense Lloyd Austin, there is growing concern in the United States over this rising death toll inside Gaza. At least 16,000 people killed since October 7th, according to the Hamas-run health ministry. Raf, let's talk more about the hostages. More protests were held this weekend, calling on the Israeli government to re re resume hostage negotiations with Hamas. The National Security Council's John Kirby spoke yesterday to NBC's Kristen Welker on Meet the Press about the hostage situation. Let's take a listen to that. Well, there are no official negotiations going on right now, Kristen, and that's because Hamas. Hamas failed to come up with yet another list of women and children that could be released, and we know they're holding additional women and children, not combatants, not female IDF soldiers, but innocent civilians, women and children that they have that they couldn't put on a list and, and, uh, and turn that in. So unfortunately, the negotiations have stopped. We do believe that uh, th there are still a number of Americans that are being held hostage, uh, Kristen, uh, and we're, largely we're getting that from communication with the family members uh, and, of course, uh, our Israeli counterparts. Raf, I understand we're hearing from recently released hostages about all this. What are they saying and what are the odds right now Israel returns to the bargaining table? So the odds of getting a new ceasefire agreement looking pretty remote right now. Israeli negotiators left Qatar on Saturday. Shortly afterwards, Hamas said there's going to be no more exchanges, hostages for prisoners until the end of the war. Now, guys, these could be tough negotiating tactics by both sides. The Qataris say they are doing everything they can with the support of the United States to try to get these talks back on track. But the expectation right now here in Israel and, frankly, inside Gaza is there's going to be more fighting before there's going to be more talking. In terms of the hostages, there was a big rally here in Tel Aviv Saturday night, and we heard recorded video testimonials from some of the hostages who emerged over the last week, including one woman who had been freed just two days earlier. And one of the things she said was that when she was down in the tunnels underneath Gaza City, she kept pinching herself, hoping, hoping, hoping that she would wake up from this nightmare, which, of course, turned out to be real. Guys. Right. Incredible to hear these harrowing stories. Raf Sanchez in Tel Aviv, thank you so much. Yeah, well, we are learning more about those attacks on commercial vessels in the Red Sea. The U.S. military says the USS Kearney warship shot down two attack drones that were heading toward it. It's believed the attacks were launched by Iranian-backed rebels in Yemen who are trying to prevent ships from Israel and nations that support Israel from traveling through the Red Sea. NBC News correspondent Aaron Gilchrist reports. U.S. defense officials confirming to NBC News the USS Kearney responded after four attacks on three civilian ships in the Red Sea off Yemen. At one point, the Kearney shot down a drone heading toward it. The U.S. not sure whether the Kearney itself was a target. One of the attacks hitting a British merchant ship. As the Kearney sped toward it to help, the U.S. destroyer shot down another drone. Two other civilian ships report they were hit, and the Kearney shot down a third drone. Late Sunday, Iran-backed Houthis posting a video claiming responsibility for the attacks. Houthi rebels took control of much of Yemen in 2014 and were considered a terrorist organization by the U.S. government until 2021. The Houthis calling the Red Sea strikes a show of support for Palestinians in Gaza, part of a series of recent incidents in that region. This edited Houthi video with faces blurred that was released in November shows a helicopter landing on an Israeli cargo ship, armed soldiers quickly taking control and taking the ship back to Yemen. The USS Kearney is part of the Gerald R. Ford aircraft carrier strike group sent to the Mediterranean Sea after the Hamas attack in Israel. The Kearney alone responsible for shooting down Houthi drones three times in the last six weeks. It's a provocation. We'll see some reaction but again, I think Secretary Austin will try and keep it below the threshold of causing wider, wider war. 
U.S. forces have also been facing threats on land. Bases in Iraq and Syria have come under attack by militia groups supported by Iran approximately 75 times in the last two months, injuring dozens. Meanwhile, three defense officials say U.S. forces stopped five people preparing an attack drone near Kirkuk, Iraq, Sunday afternoon. The U.S. military was able to destroy it before it launched and is now working to verify whether anyone was killed. Back to you. All right, Aaron, thank you so much. Lieutenant Colonel Daniel Davis joins us now with a closer look at potentially this next stage of war. He is the senior fellow and military expert at Defense Priorities. Lieutenant Colonel, always great to have you with us. Thank you so much. So what, with what Aaron just laid out there, I mean, how concerned do you think Pentagon leaders are about becoming involved in something that is escalating in potentially this shooting war with Iranian proxies? How big is the concern here? Well, I, th I think the concern is, is quite large and, and quite justified because it, it, America's vital national interests are best served by making sure this does not es escalate beyond the Gaza Strip. And, uh, of course, that's, we now see all these issues going on in the, in the Red Sea, uh, in the areas around it. We see in Iraq and in Syria where our troops are. Uh, and, of course, the, the biggest concern is potentially Hezbollah attacking Israel from the north, especially as they get further into the south part of the Gaza Strip. And all of those things could, could cause havoc for the region. And, and anything that draws the United States in uh, is going to just potentially draw us into another war that we absolutely cannot have. And I think it's important that you see the Secretary of Defense and, and other senior officials are really do put a lot of pressure on Israel to rein in some of these uh, uh, attacks that are killing so many civilians because that is the key thing to, that could undermine Western support for Israel and could put, uh, you know, make even things even worse among those who are trying to attack them. Let's talk more about the Israel-Hamas war. Israel has now expanded its military campaign to southern Gaza, as we've been reporting this hour. Israeli Prime Minister Netanyahu vows to continue the war, quote, until we achieve all its goals. What do you make of how Israel is now approaching this next phase of the war since the ceasefire stopped? Well, listen, I think that there's a mismatch between their stated political objectives and their tactical operations, what they're trying to do to accomplish it. You, your correspondent said just a second ago that Israel was trying to uh, do the same thing in the south that it did in the north. And as you can see with your own eyes there, the the population density is so much higher now in the south than it was in the north, and there's already at least 15,000 people have been killed. But the bigger issue is, though, that Israel doesn't appear to be uh, careful at all in what they're attacking. They're just literally leveling entire city blocks, meaning that even if they succeed tactically in destroying Hamas, there's nowhere for all these people to live, and the, the, the situation is just going to be even more dire, even from... Things like disease and, and other kinds of illnesses that there's no hospitals. People can die from that as well as the other. And and global uh, public opinion could turn against Israel and, and could keep them from achieving their objective of being peace. And I'm telling you, that from what I've seen my own eyes in, in the Middle East and, and other combat, when you kill a lot of innocent people, you create many more enemies than you take out. And I just don't think that they're going to succeed, bring peace by the, the use of this uh, weapons. So Secretary of State Blinken is making it clear that the U.S. wants to minimize that civilian suffering, especially as the IDF moves into southern Gaza. He called on Israel specifically to create safe zones. This is for civilians near the fighting, and we've seen that grid that kind of lays out different areas within Gaza. So are safe zones an effective way to minimize civilian deaths? What else is needed? Do you think that does anything? Well, I'll tell you, I, I think that Secretary Austin's comment was spot on when he said you could have a, a tactical success and a strategic loss if you don't change your tactics and do these things for the very reason I just laid out there. These issues of safe zones, really, I mean, it, it doesn't really mean much because you've seen that they told him to go, this Palestinians to go from the north down to Khan Yunus. Now they're telling them to leave Khan Yunus, but there's no escape routes. They don't know how to get to some of these places. They can't get to some of them because of these rubbled areas where you can't even physically get through, and they don't know what's safe for now, and it could be unsafe an hour from now. So but it's really just nothing but confusion, and it's not effective at all. Lieutenant Colonel Daniel Davis, thank you, as always, for joining us this morning. Thank you. 105 hostages were released from captivity during the week-long ceasefire between Israel and Hamas. But for many, despite their freedom, the pain 
will not go away anytime soon. Yeah, hostages may experience a range of psychological effects as a result of such a traumatic experience, from PTSD to grief and depression. The symptoms could also be long-lasting. Dr. Hagai Levine joins us now with a closer look at this. He is the head of the medical and resilience team for the Hostages and Missing Families Forum. Dr. Levine, thank you so much for joining us for this important conversation. Walk us through some of the immediate care that the recently released hostages will need, are getting, what is it doctors are looking for when treating them right away? So first, when they come, first to see if there is life-threatening condition, and for, for at least one of them, she was at life-threatening condition and needed immediate and urgent care. Then to see if there are immediate problems, medical problems that need to be attended at the same time. To, to you know to see and start the recovery and the support for their very tough and sophisticated um, mental status with that to identify other problems the artery problems functional problems and to start the, the recovery process first in hospital then in the community with the support of the families with professional support and help and I must say, it's very difficult to start the recovery process when at the same time, for many of them, still their beloved, their husbands, their fathers are still in captivity and they don't know about their whereabouts and about their medical condition. And that's really problematic from any point of view. And of course, from mental point of view, to, to start and recover when you're still worried and you're still in the twilight zone of not knowing what happened to your beloved. Some of them, we had to tell them the bad news that their beloved were murdered on the October 7th massacre. Mm. As we are learning more about the conditions that the hostages were held in, being in those tunnels, being in the dark for over a month, hunger, untreated injuries, sleep deprivation, uh, knowing all that background, how do you go about even kind of helping them re-enter society after such a horrific experience? I will say, but I must say first that those are the people that came back. You know, others such as Hanan Yablonka, I'm holding his card that his family gave me, got Addison disease, is not getting the prednisone that he must have just to survive. And there are many more that have illnesses and injuries still from October 7th that were not treated. So now when we treat those we can, we cannot forget about those who we, we cannot treat. For, for those who came, so, you know, some of them had orthopedic, needed orthopedic surgery. They went horrible care in Gaza. Now we need to try to correct and to start rehabilitation. It's very complex. And with the mental status, you know, it's independent. It's individual for each one of them. But many have undergone psychological terror in captivity. They told them that, you know, horrible things. What happened for some children, children they showed them. The whole films of the massacres that I recommend no one to see, and they showed it to them again and again and told them, you shouldn't cry. If you cry, we will kill you. You know, that's very, very difficult situation to recover from. But we give all the support, and the, there is amazing recovery ability of, of children and of people in general. So I'm still optimistic. We know from the past that some uh, survivors were able to, to recover, but the more the longer it takes, it will be more difficult to recover. We have seen the film of Yarden Bibas, who was told few that his beloved Kfir and Ariel, the babies, and, and, and uh, his wife Shiri are alive. And then he was told that they are dead. We don't know what is the truth. He doesn't know what is the truth. And he's mm. worried sick, I'm sure. Uh, so that is a psychological terror on us and on the hostages. What type of long-term support will they need? What does that look like in the months ahead? Yes, so I must say that there is like a first euphoric stage that you come and you are hugged and you, you, you know, you feel very strong. And then when you go out, you need a protective environment. And it's different from individuals. They, some of them go because they don't have home now. Their home was burned. They don't have a community to return to. They don't have home to return to. They are in, you know, in hotels in a lot or in the Dead Sea, in a environments that you don't have much privacy. So that's difficult. We need to provide them a protective environment and to start doing, to be active. They need to get back control over their life, to start again, cook for themselves, to, you know, to be able to take a shower independently, because many of them did not take any shower in captivity, to start. And you know what we see? Some of them come here and help us now with the 
the, the efforts to release the hostages, and that's very helpful for them to be active and to feel that they can contribute to others. Dr. Hagai Levine, thank you so much for your time this morning mm -hmm. and for everything you're doing to help people and to help us understand mm -hmm. what some of these released hostages are going through. It's very helpful, the media attention and the world support. Thank you. Thank you. Well, now let's go to Washington, where it is expected to be another eventful week for lawmakers, just days after becoming the sixth member of the House of Representatives ever to be expelled. Former Congressman George Santos is threatening to file ethics complaints against several lawmakers, both Republicans and Democrats. With Santos out, Republicans have an even smaller majority in the House now, but could still vote to authorize an impeachment inquiry into President Biden as early as this week. Let's bring in NBC News Capitol Hill correspondent Ali Vitale and NBC News White House correspondent Monica Alba. Good morning to both of you. Yeah, good morning, Ali. Let's start with you. What exactly is Santos alleging what happens if he does file these ethics complaints. Yeah, look, he's gone, but desperate to not be forgotten here, guys, because Santos on his way out the door is now trying to make good on some of the threats that he made when he was still in office. You might remember that right after Thanksgiving, Santos took to Twitter, or now known as X, once again, to try to level a bunch of claims without names to them about frauds and other things that his colleagues were doing in office. Now, on his way out the door and after being expelled, he's targeting some of those lawmakers that actually went against him. People in the New York delegation, for example, like Congresswoman Nicole Maliotakis, Congressman Mike Lawler, Congressman Nick, Nick Lalota. And then he's also looking over state lines in New Jersey at Congressman Rob Menendez. All of these lawmakers saying that they're not taking this seriously. But look, the way it works is that anyone can refer a complaint to the Office, office of Congressional Ethics. They may or may not take it up, but clearly Santos is trying to avail himself of that after his colleagues kicked him to the curb. So, Ali, we know a special election will be held to fill Santos's seat to make sure another name is put on that office door. <laughs> When's that probably going to happen? What's that election going to look like? Look, it has to happen soon, but that still means that it's a few months away from having a new name on the door of that office there. The field that's starting to coalesce, though, is pretty interesting, especially because you already had Republicans and Democrats vying for this seat, including the person who previously had held it. That's going to be a contested race, but one potential entry over the weekend is certainly turning some heads up on Capitol Hill. It's someone that Santos himself knows quite well, because this is someone who worked for him in Congress, Con uh, Senator Vish Burra is trying to now succeed his former boss for this congressional seat. It's not maybe not official yet, but certainly he's stoking the embers of what could be a run. And Santos himself on X interacted with one of Burra's tweets about this, seemingly being supportive, but we'll see down the road what this field actually looks mm -hmm. like. Mm -hmm. Monica, let's bring you in here and now talk about one of the other big stories shaping up for this week on the Hill GOP efforts to impeach President Biden over the weekend. House Speaker Mike Johnson said he believes there are enough votes to launch an impeachment inquiry. Walk us through exactly what that looks like, how it's different than a full-scale impeachment effort, and how we got here. I remember, Savannah and Joe, a couple of months ago, it was then-House Speaker Kevin McCarthy who announced that this process was going to start taking place. And there were a lot of questions, though, about whether there would be votes to support formalizing it. And that's what we're now talking about here potentially happening in the coming weeks. At the time, back in September, it did not seem that there were enough Republican members who could vote to support a formal impeachment inquiry, but that kicked off the proceedings nevertheless, which means that these GOP-led committees can begin their work of issuing some subpoena requests, of doing some of their investigation. But we also know now that Speaker Johnson is signaling this at a time, he says, where during the Thanksgiving break, members went home to their districts. He argues that that is what they were hearing about, that people, constituents, have questions about this. And that is why he is trying to make this point that now it could be heading toward a vote, though, as you guys just talked about, the Republican majority continues to become slimmer and slimmer. So again, questions there. As other Republicans have indicated at this time that they don't know whether there is the evidence to continue on this path, but clearly this is something that they want to do heading into the critical 2024 election year. And quickly, Monica, what's the White House saying about these impeachment efforts? 
Well, they've responded to this now also for weeks, calling them politically motivated and baseless. And what the White House in a statement over the weekend is really trying to point to here is the fact that Speaker Johnson himself reportedly behind closed doors was telling Republicans, was telling his own conference a couple of weeks ago that he wasn't sure the evidence was there yet. But again, they're trying to continue to pursue this path to see if they can potentially uncover any other evidence. But as the White House has pointed to repeatedly, there's nothing that's come to light so far that has implicated the president in any wrongdoing in terms of these potential business dealings. Jones Monica and. Alba, Ali Vitale, thank you both so much. It was a busy weekend in Iowa for the leading Republican candidates for president. Former President Trump and Florida Governor Ron DeSantis spent time campaigning across the state, meeting with voters ahead of next month's first presidential contest. For the latest, let's bring in NBC News senior national politics reporter Jonathan Allen. John, good to have you with us. So Ron DeSantis announced he has campaigned in all 99 counties in Iowa. That's a staple of state politics there. On the flip side, you have former President Trump. He's held events in just 13 counties, yet still holds that huge lead, mm -hmm. according to polls. So give us a recap of what we saw over the weekend between those two rivals. Hey, good morning, Joe. Good morning, Savannah. Look, if you're one of the candidates, you would much rather have Donald uh, Trump's position uh, in the polls and have visited 13 counties versus Ron DeSantis's position in the polls, trailing Trump by 30 plus points uh, in Iowa and, and more nationally. Uh, uh, and having visited every county. Uh, what we saw this week, though, was Ron DeSantis finished that 99-county tour after months of campaigning across the state. Uh, the good news for him is he's uh, out there telling people that he's going to outwork everybody else. Uh, I think what the way that he put it is, uh, if I'm willing to do this, uh, that shows you that I would be a servant, not a ruler. Um, finished up in Jasper County, just east of Des Moines. And then you had Trump this week uh, in Cedar Rapids uh, doing a commit to caucus event, trying to rally his faithful, telling them that this race is not over. And of course, doing the one thing that Republicans care the most about right now, which is bashing uh, Joe Biden and trying to communicate to them that he would be the best candidate to take on the current president. So, John, as we're referencing DeSantis and the rest of the Republican field, I mean, they've continued to trail in the polls by a wide margin, not really changing too much here. Nothing nothing super of note. An NBC News Des Moines Register media comp poll in October showed Trump with a 27-point lead in Iowa. What do you think happens from those falling behind if that lead continues following the caucus? Does the field start to narrow? It's a great question, Savannah. And uh, through the magic of television, I think we can see uh, what Ron DeSantis had to say yesterday on Meet the Press. <laughs> uh, but basically, uh, what these candidates are saying is um, that while Iowa is important, uh, you're going to be able to uh, you're going to be able to um, keep going if you're one of those candidates and you lose. What DeSantis was saying was, uh, of course, that uh, candidates have won the nomination, like Donald Trump, for example, in 2016, without having won Iowa. Let's listen to what DeSantis had to say. You don't come in at least second. Would you then drop out of the race? How critical is Iowa? Well, we're, we're going to win the caucus. We, we're doing everything that, that we need to do it. Uh, but we're what if you don't, Governor? Support. What if and you I've don't? And I said from the beginning, we, we are we are we're going to win. We're going to win the we're going to win the caucus. But even apart from that, uh, there have been people that have won Iowa and not won the nomination, and vice versa. Yeah, and the big difference there, guys, uh, between people who lose Iowa and then go on to win the nomination is usually they are the candidate uh, who is leading the field nationally. Mm. There's a clear reason that they might be able to come back because they have support in places other than Iowa. You do not see that right now uh, with Ron DeSantis or Nikki Haley, the uh, folks who are basically running um, very neck and neck for uh, that second position distantly behind Trump. Yeah, also noteworthy there, Nikki Haley tied with mm -hmm. Ron DeSantis right now in that poll. John, thanks so much for joining us this morning. Appreciate Thank it. Thank you. Take care, guys. Well, showers continue to soak the Northwest. For more, let's get a check on your morning news now weather. Meteorologist Michelle Grossman is with us this morning. Hey, Michelle, good morning. Good morning. Great to see you. Happy Monday. And yeah, the West is being soaked week after week. We're onto our third week here with an atmospheric river event, and we're going to see a strong one move on shore today. So it's sort of like a parade of storms, and it's coming from the Gulf of Alaska. So we're pulling from some warmer air. That's going to cause some snow melt as well. So we do have some alerts in place. We have flood watches. That is in the green for Seattle, Eugene, down in 
Medford, Spokane also. We also have some winter storm warnings. We have some winter weather advisories because we do still expect some snow in the highest elevations of the mountains of the, Cas uh, the, of the Rockies. As we go throughout time here, this is what radar looks like. So we're getting a little bit of a break throughout the day today. It's going to pick up in intensity once again tonight, but you can see that kind of coming on short, already starting to see some heavier rain where you see those brighter colors in uh, portions of Idaho as well. Seeing the snow as well, that's in the blue here. So we're going to see some snow. We're going to see a mixture and we're also going to see that rain falling and we could see up to 11 inches of rain in some spots. That is a lot of rain. In addition to that, we're looking at wind alerts. So we're looking at high wind warnings. Winds could gust up to 65 miles per hour in time at times. Also a high wind watch uh, throughout the area as well. This is what it's going to look like as we go throughout the next several days. We have an area of low pressure that's going to bring the heavy rain once again. It's going to target Washington today, but really the Northwest has been soaked over and over again the past couple of weeks. We're going to see rel relentless rain tomorrow. Notice that plume of moisture. It's really like a river in the sky just bringing all that rain. So when you see those dark colors, that means we're going to see heavy rain. That's going to lead to flash flooding, urban flooding, river flooding, stream flooding, and it could bring some uh, the threat of avalanches and also some snow melt. Now take a look at some of these totals. The Olympics, 8 to 11 inches along the coast. This is a lot too, 2 to 6, even more locally higher amounts, and that's where you see those darker colors. And the Cascade Mountains, the highest points will see up to 9 inches of rain over the next several days. These alerts stay in place through Thursday. Now as we head towards the northeast, we're looking at winter alerts throughout portions of the interior parts of the northeast and also New England. This is going to wrap up today, but some spots in northern New England could pick up 4 to 8 inches of rain. Wow. So winter is here. Nope. We're back now with international headlines. Several climbers are dead after a volcanic eruption in Indonesia. NBC News foreign correspondent Claudio Lavanga has the details on that, as well as other headlines from around the world. Hey, Claudio, good morning. Savannah Joe, good morning. That's right. It was a furious eruption over the weekend. Well, so far, the bodies of at least 11 climbers have been recovered, but several others are still missing. Now, you can see the smoke and ash spewing as high as almost 10,000 feet into the sky. The toxic volcan volcanic ash now covers near nearby villages and towns. There were about 75 hikers in that area when the eruption happened. Most were safely evacuated, but some suffered burns. Mount Marapi is one of Indonesia's 127 active volcanoes. Now let's travel to Russia where police carried out raids on LGBTQ venues. This comes in the hills of a landmark ruling by Russia's top court to ban what they're calling the quote international LGBTQ movement sending waves of fear throughout the community. According to local news outlets the raids took place late Friday in at least three venues in Moscow. Eyewitnesses say security stopped the music and even photographed passports. And we end this short tour of the world in my corner of the world, Italy. The 12th century Garizenda Tower in the city of Bologna is known for its lazy lean. But now authorities are worried it could collapse. The city council is calling the situation highly critical. They've even started constructing a 16-foot high barrier to protect surrounding buildings and even people just in case it actually falls. So the barrier project, which is set to finish next year, is estimated to cost nearly $5 million. The Garizenda is one of two landmark towers in the city, and its lean has actually been an issue since it was first built. Well, now, I know what you're thinking about. Uh, well, wasn't the leaning tower in Pisa? Yes, but there is another one, as you can see. Well, at least for now, hopefully wow. it won't collapse anytime soon. Yeah, hopefully Joseph not. Anna. Oh, All right, Claudio, thank you so much. Thank you. Well, now let's get to the annual climate change conference that's continuing this week in Dubai. Over the weekend, a landmark agreement to reduce methane emissions was reached by some of the world's largest oil companies. They pledged to improve their leaky methane systems by 2030. CNBC's senior climate correspondent Diana Olick joins us now from the climate conference with the latest. Hey, Diana, good morning. Good to see you. So there's been a lot of skepticism about real progress being made at this conference because of where it's being held, a major oil producing nation. So was this a surprise that this agreement was able to be met? Yeah, a real pleasant surprise at that, Savannah. 50 oil and gas firms, including ExxonMobil and Saudi Aramco, representing about 40% of global oil output, they pledged to cut methane emissions to nearly zero by 2030 and to eliminate all operational greenhouse gas emissions by 2050. The inclusion of 29 national oil companies is what makes this both new and notable. Of course, there's already criticism that a pledge is one thing, but how do you enforce it? Well, I asked former BP CEO Bob Dudley, who was instrumental in the negotiations. 
There's new satellite technologies out there that can monitor methane emissions from the, that level, aircraft, uh, drones, s ground sensors, and the, the companies will have to be accountable for providing the data from that. It's going to be very hard to hide because if you look at satellites, for example, there will be nowhere to hide. Now, this is important because methane is 80 times more potent than carbon dioxide and is incredibly powerful at trapping heat. Joe and Savannah. So, Diana, the COP28 president is facing some backlash from activists at the summit over previous comments he made about phasing out fossil fuels. What more can you tell us about that? Yes, yeah, Sultan Al Jaber, the CEO of Adnock, the state run oil company and head of COP, had a heated argument in a live online event over the weekend where he said there is, quote, no science indicating that a phase out of fossil fuels is needed to restrict global warming to 1.5 degrees Celsius. He also said a phase out of fossil fuels would not allow sustainable development, quote, unless you want to take the world back into caves. That was not well received here by a lot of the climate folks. And Diana, quickly before we let you go, finance. It's taken center stage today. How are banks, investors, how are they part of this conversation and ultimately a transition here to clean energy and tech? Well, it's just a massive opportunity because there are literally trillions of dollars at stake. So I spoke with Citi's head of corporate banking about the billions in pledges we've seen from governments in these first days of the COP. We're encouraged to see uh, commitments from governments, from developmental financial institutions, multilaterals, et cetera. Those are important. Um, to, but uh, where I think the real change is going to come from is, is sort of private sector innovation, the, the need to mobilize lots of capital to help, uh, to help companies and, and, and sovereign uh, entities uh, develop new sources of, of, of energy in particular. Uh, those, the amounts required there are, are staggering. And he says that's just an enormous opportunity for City and its clients. So he and others like him are at the COP to find out how those clients are planning to play in the energy transition and how they'll look to the banks and capital markets to help them finance that. Back to All you guys. Right, Diana Olick from Dubai for us. Thank you so much. Welcome back. Jared Joseph Powell, the Los Angeles man accused of shooting three homeless people as they slept last week, will make his first court appearance later this morning. This comes as we are learning more about how police use controversial technology to track Powell. Here's NBC News correspondent Dana Griffin with the details. This is an automated license plate reader, similar to the one responsible for capturing a suspected serial killer. I'm grateful that this suspect in this case is in custody. Police say 33-year-old Jared Powell murdered four men in four days, a Los Angeles County worker and three homeless men. We know there's controversy out there about the usage of this system. If we did not enter that plate into the system, uh, this individual that we believe is responsible for at least four murders may have been out there and reoffended. Here's how the technology works. Investigators enter a license plate number into the system. If that vehicle passes a license plate reader like this, it pings, alerting police. That's what happened Thursday when Powell's car entered Beverly Hills. This isn't broad surveillance. You don't have everyone's license plate number in the system, do you? No, it doesn't work like that. That alerts on something that an officer put into the database, which tells them this vehicle's wanted. By 2019, a state audit found 230 California law enforcement agencies were using an ALPR system. San Jose just installed more readers, but this year, the city council in Coachella rejected a plan to add cameras to their city. Civil liberties groups have long raised privacy concerns and feared the technology could be abused. Given the hazard of political spying with these kinds of uh, high-tech surveillance technologies, uh, it is very important that there be strict safeguards, including rapid deletion of the information that has been collected and limits on when it can be shared. Beverly Hills police say they delete footage after 13 months, and the technology helps them track only specific suspects. What it does is allow us to stop the right person in the right vehicle and uh, again, I call that precision policing. Dana Griffin, NBC News, Los Angeles.
Today, the U.S. Supreme Court will hear arguments in a case involving drug manufacturer Purdue Pharma, the maker of the highly addictive painkiller OxyContin. One law expert called this the biggest bankruptcy case the court has seen in decades and would protect the company and the Sackler family that once controlled the company from any civil lawsuits for its role in the deadly opioid crisis. NBC News Justice and Intelligence correspondent Ken Delaney joins us now with a preview. Ken, good morning. So this case is Harrington versus Purdue Pharma. Explain to us what What's being argued here and how this case made its way to the Supreme Court? Good morning, Joe and Savannah. That's right, Purdue Pharma and the Sackler family that founded it and ran it are widely considered to be some of the arch villains of the opioid crisis that is still killing tens of thousands of Americans a year. This powerful drug, OxyContin, uh, was crushed. It was a time-release drug that could produce a euphoric high, and it was widely abused and fueled opioid addiction. And this company twice pleaded guilty to criminal charges related to deceptive marketing. And finally, in 2020, uh, involving some civil Civil lawsuits and the criminal uh, charges, the company and the family reached a massive settlement deal where the family was going to turn over $6 billion to a group of plaintiffs and states and individuals, the Sackler family itself and the company. Now, uh, what's at issue here is the company shielded itself through bankruptcy and therefore, uh, under the terms of this deal, it would be immune from future claims if it paid this money. So would the Sackler family, but the catch is the Sackler family never actually had to file for bankruptcy and they get to keep a large amount of their billions of dollars in fortune. And so uh, the U.S. trustee, an element of the Justice Department that uh, regulates and governs the bankruptcy system, opposed this settlement. It was knocked out in the courts, and now it's found its way to the Supreme Court. And the question here really is, can, uh, can a, a, a group of individuals shield themselves under the bankruptcy process without actually mm -hmm. declaring for bankruptcy, guys? So how would this settlement help people impacted by the opioid crisis? So that's the rub, right? A lot of people involved in this settlement, state governments, attorney generals, individual plaintiffs, really want this thing to go forward because it's billions of dollars that would go to opioid treatment and uh, 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 advertisements to promote awareness and all kinds of programs similar to what we saw with the tobacco settlement. And all of that is on hold while this case winds its way through the courts. And if the Supreme Court knocks this out, they're back to the drawing board here and they may never reach a settlement for mm. years, which means a lot of people won't see that money, guys. Yeah, following up on that, Ken, we don't know yet how the court will rule, but what are some of the potential ramifications once we do get a decision. Right. Well, not only are there ramifications for the opioid crisis and whether folks get this money, Joe, there are obviously huge ramifications for the bankruptcy system, but there are also implications for other mass tort settlements. For example, the Boy Scouts of America, the Catholic Church, they availed themselves of this provision in the bankruptcy law under settlements involving mass sex abuse in those institutions. And so they're concerned that those deals will unravel if the Supreme Court knocks this provision out, and it has implications for other mass tort cases that are pending right now in the court. So this is about as big as it gets in front of the Supreme Court. Folks. All right. Ken Delaney, and we know you'll keep an eye on it. Thank mm -hmm. you so much. We are back now with some financial headlines. Wheels are up, and so are the dollar signs in a new billion-dollar deal for Alaska Airlines. CNBC's Bertha Coombs has the latest on that and other money news. Bertha, good morning. Hey, good morning. You know, we like to talk about Merger Mondays. Alaska Airlines uh, stuck a deal to merge with Hawaiian Airlines for nearly $2 billion. This will be the second largest U.S. airline merger in just over a year. It's expected to face close scrutiny, though, from regulators. They've been wary of mergers between small airlines, despite the fact that 80 percent of the market belongs to the big guys, United, American, Delta, and Southwest. Now, this tie-up uh, with Hawaiian would give Alaska control of more than 50 percent of the market for flights to Hawaii. Walmart is the latest big company to stop advertising on X, formerly known as Twitter. The retail giant says the halt is not because of a change in its ad policies, but about how well those spots have actually performed on the social media platform. Walmart says it largely stopped buying ads in October before Elon Musk commented on an anti-Semitic post and Media Matters reported X placed ads for certain companies next to posts supporting Nazis. Walmart's final ads ran just before Thanksgiving. 
And Americans plan to increase the amount of tips they give to service providers, such as housekeepers, mail carriers, during the holidays this year. A new survey from Bankrate finds that about 15% plan to tip more. 13% say they'll actually tip less. That leaves about 44% who pretty much are going to say the same as last year. And one in four who didn't tip last year and say they don't plan to this year. Just 5% are still undecided. The average tip for a housekeeper for child care per, or child care provider will be about 50 bucks, about 40 bucks for landscapers, $25 for teachers and trash collectors, and $20 for your neighborhood mail carrier. I, I have to say, I never tipped my mail carrier. I mean, you know, I'll leave cookies for them. But <laughs> I, I think, I too, in New York, it's hard. It's hard. It's hard. It's you got to catch them. <laughs> yeah, you don't really interface with them the way you might, you know, in yeah. a neighborhood or something. Yeah. yeah. All right. One Interesting. more thing to add to the holiday there list you go. this I know. month. Happy right. holidays. We're back with a box office weekend fit for a queen. Queen B, that is. Beyonce's hit concert movie, Renaissance, a film by Beyonce, raked in $21 million nationally. It beat expectations by becoming the first film in two decades to open with more than $20 million on the weekend after Thanksgiving. Beyonce wrote, directed, and produced the film and will take home 50% of box office earnings, not too shabby, adding to the already impressive $579 million the Renaissance tour has already earned. And a great Is opportunity for folks who maybe didn't get to see the concert in person to take it all in in the theater. Too. That's me, and I cannot wait to see it. I'm yeah. definitely going to. Are you going to? Yes, I will. It's I can't point. wait. All right. Thanks, Joe. Yep. Well, finally this hour, the legendary rock group KISS has taken their final bow after nearly half a century of rocking out to crowds all around the world. Well, over the weekend, the band ended their long run together with a final show at Madison Square Garden, just blocks away from where they first started, actually. NBC News correspondent George Solis has more on their final KISS goodbye. It's a declaration rock legends KISS have made for nearly 50 years. Rocking out night after night with their legion of fans known as the KISS Army. But Saturday in New York, the Rock and Roll Hall of Famers relinquishing that title in the final show of their farewell tour. Original members Gene Simmons and Paul Stanley together on stage at Madison Square Garden just 10 blocks from where the band first started. The Empire State Building even lighting up for the occasion. Only in New York City can four guys off the streets of New York have a dream of putting together the band they always wanted to see on stage. Known for their on-stage antics, signature leather garments, and iconic grease face paint, the band is considered one of rock's most influential bands selling more than 100 million albums worldwide. Over the years, the lineup changed. In 1980, drummer Peter Chris left the band. Two years later, guitarist Ace Frehley left to pursue a solo career. Yeah, 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 yeah. Some fans wonder if this truly is the end for Kiss. After all, the band called it quits more than 20 years ago, but others confident this time there will be no encore. I panic bought a ticket about three weeks ago. I spent about $550, but you know, I just like had to be here. But one thing is certain, their legacy and their message will continue to reverberate long after they're gone. I wanna rock and roll all night. Hey, come on, party every day. George Solis, NBC News. Pretty cool. Very cool. We'll see. Yeah, you right? never know. I mean, <laughs> we hear it all the time. Yeah, we and do. Those artists, Musicians, they just got to keep athletes. performing. Yeah, and they just keep coming back. So very cool to see. When I retire, I'm done. I'm just yeah. letting you know that right now. All no right. fake outs. <laughs> That's going to do it for this hour of morning news now. But the news continues right now. Right now on Morning News Now, new fears the war between Israel and Hamas could be expanding. A U.S. ship shot down multiple drones in the Red Sea after attacks on three civilian ships in the area. Where the attacks came from and how the U.S. government is responding. Well, in Gaza, the Israeli military confirms it's now operating in the southern part of the Strip. With civilians who fled to the south now being asked to evacuate again, many say there's nowhere safe to go. We'll have the latest from the ground.
Plus, officials in Arizona say they're shutting down a border crossing to deal with the overwhelming number of migrants coming into the U.S. The trend officials say is causing the closure and why Texas's governor says he's taking his own legal battle at the border all the way to the Supreme Court. And a new shocking report about air traffic controllers, some allegedly showing up drunk or high to work, with others even falling asleep on the job. We're digging into the new findings and how the FAA is responding as we enter the busy holiday travel season. Good to have you with us. We are going to start this hour with new developments in the attacks on commercial vessels in the Red Sea. The U.S. military says the USS Kearney warship shot down two attack drones that were heading toward it. It's believed the attacks were launched by Iranian-backed rebels in Yemen who are trying to prevent ships from headed to Israel and nations that support Israel from traveling through the Red Sea. NBC News Chief International Correspondent Keir Simmons joins us with the latest on this. Hey, Keir, good morning. Savannah, Joe, good morning. Fingers pointed at Iran again this morning after a U.S. warship reported hour after hour of missiles and drones in the strategically and commercially critical Red Sea. U.S. Central Command saying there's every reason to believe the attacks are fully enabled by Iran. This morning, renewed fears of a wider escalation of the war by Iran-backed militants. A sustained attack reportedly over seven hours on shipping in the Red Sea and an American destroyer, the USS Kearney, drawn into the fighting. In a video address, Iran-backed Houthi rebels in Yemen claiming responsibility for some of the attacks, saying it was a response to the war. U.S. Central Command says three ships connected to 14 nations were involved. The Kearney detecting threats to the other vessels and responding, shooting down three drones, including one headed in its direction. It's unclear if the American ship was a direct target, but three commercial vessels were hit, some sustaining limited damage. Last month, Houthi rebels posted an edited video, faces blurred, seizing an Israeli-owned ship. The threat to crucial commercial shipping in the Red Sea is just one strand of the spiralling tension in the region. For more than a month, US forces in Syria and Iraq have faced drone and rocket attacks by Iran-backed militia. Iran is capable of escalating the conflict, put pressure on both the Israelis and the United States. Iran's foreign minister meeting his counterpart from Amman over the weekend. Oh, yeah. Declaring the U.S. must bear the consequences of the genocide and war crimes in Gaza and the West Bank. Meanwhile, three defense officials telling NBC News the U.S. military struck a drone stage site in Iraq. They say five individuals were preparing an attack. Some were killed. In responding to accusations of genocide, last month, National Security Council spokesman John Kirby said what Hamas wants is genocide. They want to wipe Israel off the map. Meanwhile, Savannah, this morning, Turkey, an ally of the U.S., its president, aiming more fury at Prime Minister Netanyahu. All Savannah? right, Keir Simmons, thank you so much. Israeli Defense Forces are issuing evacuation orders for people living in southern Gaza as negotiations for a new ceasefire with Hamas leaders have broken down. It comes as bombardments across all of Gaza intensify. NBC News Chief Foreign Correspondent Richard Engel has the latest from Israel. The chief of staff of the Israeli military said overnight that operations are now beginning and clearly intensifying in southern Gaza and that they would be just as powerful as they have been up until now in northern Gaza. Israel is now focusing its military campaign in southern Gaza, where many Hamas leaders and fighters are believed to have fled. Israel has dropped leaflets with maps dividing the Gaza Strip into a grid and has been telling Palestinians to move from one quadrant to another for their safety. But so far, Gazans don't seem to understand the maps, don't have internet connections to read the QR code, or simply aren't listening. Gazans complain they've been corralled into the south and are now under attack. The Biden administration has urged Israel to be more precise. A senior U.S. military official tells NBC News he was taken aback by the ferocity of Israel's renewed campaign that has seen Israel attack apartment buildings. The, the United States urged publicly, repeatedly, Israel to do more to avoid civilian casualties. Do you think 
Are you listening to that? Have you taken that on board? Absolutely. We're very attentive to the administration and from a military to military perspective, we are constantly engaging with our American counterparts. There is no fairy godmother that will make Hamas disappear. In the southern city of Rafa, our crew followed volunteers digging through the night at a home they say was hit by an Israeli strike. They find a few survivors and at least 14 bodies. Rafa is on the Egyptian border. Gazans can't go any further south than here. Nearby, Hanan Bayouk and her husband Fati live with five other families. When she was pregnant with triplets, Israel allowed Hanan to leave Gaza to give birth in Jerusalem. But when her permit expired, she had to go home, just before Hamas attacked and Gaza was completely sealed off. We found her babies at a hospital in East Jerusalem. Doctors tell us they're developing well. We managed to connect Hana and her husband Fatih on a video call for a precious peek. Sabah al khair, sabah al khair. Just as Najwa was waking up. <laughs> the war separated us. As a mother, I wish I could hug my girls, Hanan says. At the moment, there seems to be little hope for a ceasefire, with Hamas saying it will not release more hostages as long as the military offensive continues. Israel saying it will continue the offensive unless Hamas releases hostages. All right, Richard Engel, thank you so much. NBC News military analyst Colonel Jack Jacobs joins us now with more on these latest developments. Hi, Colonel. Always great to have you. So Bernie Sanders and other Democratic senators, they're starting to say they are done what they're calling asking nicely for Israel to do more to reduce civilian casualties in Gaza. They say they must adopt more effective measures to protect civilian life in order to receive U.S. aid. Other Democrats, though, don't want to set guidelines on aid. But what do you think about that? Is placing conditions on military aid an effective way to get results, especially on something like this, protecting civilians? Well, there have been calls before and in previous wars as well in the area uh, for strictures on the distribution of ammunition and other support to Israel. Um, I think we're inured to the, uh, the notion of the Six-Day War when Israel in extremely short order ran over its attackers and, uh, and secured a victory. And the perception that uh, this kind of war in particular, in an urban area with the enemy in, in, uh, in revetments and with civilian casualties mounting, but the enemy Hamas using uh, civilians as shields, the perception that this can be a surgical uh, military operation, uh, th that doesn't happen in real life, particularly in urban terrain, it's going to be extremely difficult not to have civilian casualties when there's such a concentration of civilians in the battle area. We've seen this before in all wars, and it's not going to change now. The, what will happen uh, is probably that Hamas will agree to some sort of ceasefire because that works to their tremendous advantage, Savannah. So let's look specifically here at, at Israel trying to create these safe zones for the next phase of the war with the goal to protect innocent civilian lives. But what is the strategy when Hamas fighters position themselves in these safe zones? Well, I mean, the tactics are going to remain the same. Uh, the Israeli Defense Force is going to have to go house to house, street to street, block to block. What's really significant here is something uh, that, uh, that Richard mentioned, and that is that the southern border with Egypt is closed. Uh, Egypt does not want the Palestinians inside Egypt, which is why the border is closed. Egypt does not have any refugee camps, uh, and it's difficult to envision how that would, uh, would be engineered, even if they did have uh, refugee camps. So the, the Gazans are stuck south of the, between the Wadi on the one hand and the southern border of Gaza on the other. And as long as uh, Arab nations do not take Palestinians in, particularly Egypt, uh, you're going to see a greater concentration of, Palis of, uh, of, of Gazans in the southern part and specific areas, southern part of Gaza, which will make their plight even more difficult, Joe. 
Let's talk about the negotiations in terms of hostages and a ceasefire. Talks have broken down. Israeli officials withdrew from those negotiations. Now Qatar and the U.S. are working to try to negotiate another ceasefire. But is there any hope really here? I mean, we just heard Richard Engel say that there's little hope. What do you think about that, that they will get back to the negotiating table? Is it too far gone? Well, if you start with the assumption that Hamas would really like to have a ceasefire, and quite frankly, so would so would the Israeli Defense Force. Uh, one's expectation is that there is liable to be a ceasefire. Whether or not it's going to come soon is a different story altogether. But Qatar has been doing uh, the job of negotiating between the two sides, and since particularly Hamas would like to see a ceasefire because that works at their great both tactical and strategic advantage. Uh, there is a possibility you might have a ceasefire soon. What broke down before was Hamas's refusal to release the names of the of the people it was going to the hostages it was going to release, and that's why they broke down. If Qatar can renegotiate and get those lists done, there's liable to be a ceasefire one of these days mm -hmm. soon. Colonel Jack Jacobs, as always, we appreciate your time this morning. Sure. Now to Capitol Hill, where recently expelled Congressman George Santos is vowing to file ethics complaints against some of his former colleagues. This is House Republicans move toward a vote on a formal impeachment inquiry of President Biden. NBC News Capitol Hill correspondent Ryan Nobles has the latest from Washington. Ryan, good morning. Hey, Joe, good morning. And there's no doubt the George Santos scandal was a major distraction for lawmakers on Capitol Hill. And the fallout from his short time in office continues at a time when Congress has a lot to get done. George Santos may be gone. Congressman, what do you say to your constituents? But he isn't going away quietly. Got to get out of my way. The man who last week became only the sixth member of the House of Representatives to be expelled says he plans to file ethics complaints against his ex-colleagues that led the charge to get him out. Among them, Staten Island's Nicole Maliotakis. We know that George Santos is a serial liar. I mean, he's obviously scorned since being expelled. It's unlikely those complaints go anywhere. But the vote that led to his removal revealed deep divisions within the GOP ahead of a busy sprint to the end of the year, where Congress is hoping to pass several important pieces of legislation, including aid to Israel, Ukraine, and Taiwan, as well as a border security package. Those negotiations are making little progress. So instead, House leadership is focusing on something else. We have a duty to pursue the facts where they lead. The impeachment inquiry into President Joe Biden is already well underway, with Republicans accusing the president and his family of corrupt business deals. But so far, they've produced no hard evidence to back up their claims. For his part, the president has repeatedly denied any wrongdoing. That inquiry was launched without a vote under former Speaker Kevin McCarthy. But now Republicans are having trouble enforcing high-profile subpoenas of witnesses like the president's son, Hunter Biden. They acknowledge a formal vote would help move that forward. A formal impeachment inquiry vote on the floor will allow us to take it to the next necessary step. And I think it's something we have to do at this juncture. The move to formalize impeachment comes as the right wing members and Speaker Mike Johnson's ranks are getting increasingly antsy. His leadership is not conservative enough. And the Senate Majority Leader Chuck Schumer said that he plans to put a supplemental aid package on the floor, and it could happen as soon as this week. But if it does not include a border package that some Republicans can support, it likely cannot pass. Joe? All right, Ryan, thank you. And now to the headlines coming from the southern border. U.S. officials say they are temporarily closing a port of entry in Arizona today because of an overwhelming number of migrants coming into the country from there. And in Texas, state leaders are voicing their frustration after a number of court rulings dealt a blow to their legal fight over using barbed wire and river buoys to keep people out. NBC News correspondent Morgan Chesky joins us now from the border near Eagle Pass, Texas. Hey, Morgan, good morning. Hey, Savannah, good morning. And amid that legal back and forth with Texas and the Biden administration, the number of migrants coming across at the U.S. southern border is simply undeniable. And now with crossings closed, both here in Eagle Pass and also Arizona, the biggest question of all, what will it take to stop this new surge of migrants? 
This morning, Texas and Arizona feeling the brunt of what authorities are calling a new border migration trend. The numbers are increasing. They really are. New groups of migrants arriving so rapidly, federal authorities are temporarily closing the remote Lukeville port of entry in Arizona. The Border Patrol there reporting more than 17,000 arrests in just the last week. And those numbers rising as temperatures drop, leaving migrant men, women and children in perilous conditions. Tatiana Vera from Ecuador sharing she could barely sleep during the frigid desert night. <laughs> Meanwhile in Texas, migrants facing another danger. A number of people struggling to cross the Rio Grande had to be rescued as the debate over state rights on the river rages on. A U.S. appeals court ordering Texas Governor Greg Abbott to remove the 1,000-foot floating buoy barrier installed to keep migrants from crossing. The governor calling the ruling clearly wrong, promising to go all the way to the Supreme Court. Another federal judge also denying Texas the ability to block federal border agents from cutting through state-installed razor wire. The ruling coming amid reports migrants became trapped while trying to cross. And it's not just southern states coping with the influx. Chicago released its latest numbers Sunday, reporting over 13,000 migrants in 26 active shelters. The city building temporary shelters to protect even more from wintry weather. Now, it's an international crisis that I inherited. And so the work, of course, is ongoing. Um, winter's coming fast. And right now, Texas Governor Greg Abbott says he does plan to appeal both of those court rulings. Meanwhile, in Arizona, both state senators and the governor have criticized the Biden administration, saying that the temporary closure is unacceptable, and they're now demanding a better solution. Savannah? All right, Morgan Chesky, thank you so much. Time for your morning news now weather and a look at this week's forecast. Which means that Michelle Grossman is back with us. Hi, Michelle. Good morning. Hi there, guys. And the biggest weather will be in the Pacific Northwest. We have a series of storms. It's a parade of storms moving on shore. We've seen this week after week, and we're going to see it all week long. And we're going to see rainfall totals near a foot in some spots. So staying active in the West, uh, we're quite in the middle of the country, well above normal as we head towards the South Central states. The Northern Plains, you're chilly there. We have a little clipper system moving through. That's going to bring the chance of some snow. We also have some lingering snow showers in portions of New England. Now, it's going to wrap up as we head throughout the later part of today. And we do have some rain showers in the interior parts of the Northeast. Could see some rain showers and also some snow showers in the higher elevations of the Appalachians. As we move towards Wednesday, still quiet in the middle of the country, record warmed into the northern plains. We're really chilly there today. We're looking at temperatures in the 30s, right around the freezing mark in some spots. But we're going to warm it up by Wednesday. Same story in the south central states, the central plains as well. Lots of sunshine, too, in the south central states. That flood risk does continue in portions of the Pacific Northwest. We're going to see the chance for uh, avalanches, some snow melt, and that heavy rainfall, and then higher mountain snow. Now, as we head towards the east, still quiet, too, looking at the chance of some snow along the Appalachians once again on Wednesday. By Friday, widespread snow in portions of the inner mountain west, still wet in the west. We're looking at December warmth continuing throughout the Tennessee Valley, the lower Mississippi Valley, the south central states, and into the central plains. And then once again, we're going to see some rain and snow in parts of New England. That's it's Friday. Now, taking a look at the storm in the Pacific Northwest, we have flood alerts all along the West Coast. We're looking at Washington, Oregon, and portions of Northern California. Nine million people at risk. And notice some of these alerts will stay in place uh, into Thursday because we're going to see the storm system, series of storms moving on shore. So Seattle, Portland, Eugene could see some really uh, gusty winds today, some heavy rainfall. And then we're looking at the chance of some higher elevation snow. Now, that snow level is pretty high today. So the bad news with that is we have warm warmer air in place. That's going to melt some of the snow in place, and that's going to add to some of the flooding. Winter alerts. We have winter weather advisories. We have some winter storm warnings. That includes uh, Saratoga. And then some on top of that, we have wind alerts. We're going to see winds gusting up to 65 miles per hour. Where you see that purple, that is a high wind warning. So the parade of storms continuing. It has a whole lot of moisture. We're looking at really bright colors on this future cast. That's telling us that we're expecting a lot of rain and, again, could see up to 11 inches in some spots. That's going to prompt some flash flooding, some stream flooding, River flooding and could uh, bring the threat of some avalanches as well. And we'll end it here because this is kind of mind boggling with these numbers. The Olympics, yeah. eight to 11 inches, right? The coast, two to six. And this is on top of what they've got last week and the mm. week before. Wow, wow. that's mm. a lot of rain. And it's still it so is. warm that it's not snow up there, it's just rain. And that's the, the problem. Mountains? So wow. the yeah. levels are going too high, and now we're getting the avalanche Jeez. because we're getting the snow melt. So oh. it's a mess. Tough situation, mm. right? Yeah. Thanks, Michelle. Appreciate Thank it. Thank you. Yeah.
We're back with new developments on that fatal stabbing near the Eiffel Tower in Paris over the weekend. One person was killed and at least two others were injured in the attack. Now this morning, French authorities are investigating the attack as a possible act of terrorism. NBC News foreign correspondent Josh Letterman joins us with the latest. So Josh, what can you tell us about the attack and is the suspect someone who was on the radar of French authorities? Hey, good morning, Joe. He definitely was on their radar. In fact, last night, prosecutors laid out a long list of red flags in this suspect's background, including uh, the fact that he had been previously imprisoned for four years for a previous planned terror attack that failed. He was put on a watch list after that. Uh, and since then, prosecutors say that he had maintained contact with jihadis, including some who had been responsible for other terror attacks in France. Uh, they also say that during this attack, he shouted, Allah Akbar, God is great in Arabic, uh, and then later told police that he was angry about the war in Gaza. He blamed France for being an accomplice uh, of Israel. And so clearly uh, there was a lot going on here. But they also say that this man uh, had severe mental illness, Joe. And what do we know about the victims at this point? I mean, we know one person is dead, two others injured. Did they appear to be specifically targeted? No, this appears to have been completely random from what we know. That person who was killed uh, was a German tourist. Two others uh, who were injured were hit by a hammer, including one uh, in the head. And then there were two other people uh, who were part of this attack who authorities say uh, are now in a state of shock. But as far as we can tell, uh, this was simply a random act of violence. They were not targeting anybody in particular. And that is one of the reasons why this is causing so much concern right now in Paris. Yeah, and Josh, I mean, the attack comes as Paris prepares for the Summer Olympic Games next year. So we know security is going to be tight at the Olympics. Does right. this mean they're stepping up precautions in any way? What does this mean for security? Well, interestingly, France was already at its highest level of national security alert uh, following another attack that had occurred back in October in northern France, uh, where a teacher was stabbed to death. And so there's not really a higher level of alert for them to go to. In fact, last night we heard from police saying this is kind of the new normal when it comes to security in France. They are on a permanent state of alert for terrorism, but they also say they're fully prepared to keep those Olympic Games next year safe. All right, Josh Letterman, thank you so much. Let's get you more international news now, starting with new developments in that U.S. Osprey crash off the coast of Japan just last week. This morning, Air Force officials confirmed the wreckage has been recovered. NBC News foreign correspondent Claudio Lavanga has details on that and other world headlines. Claudio, good morning. Joe Savannah, good morning. That's right. The wreckage in the end was located during a joint U.S. and Japanese dive near Yakushima. Now, the crash happened last week on Wednesday uh, when a CV-22 Osprey carrying eight American crew members crashed during a training mission. Up until this point, the remains of only one of those crew members on board were found. Right now, uh, there is an ongoing recovery effort underway. The identities of those found this morning have not been determined. Now to northern Tanzania, where heavy rain and severe flooding is causing deadly landslides. Local officials say at least 47 people are dead and dozens more injured. The fatal floods and torrential rains linked to El Nino have damaged homes and infrastructure. The flooding even washed away crops in parts of the country, impacting local livelihood. The area has seen some higher than usual rainfall and Tanzania's meteorological agency warns that it's not over yet. Rains are predicted to continue this month. And we end this sort of the world back here in Italy the, in, with an eruption. Mount Etna is lighting up the sky. The Sicilian volcano is taking its title as Europe's most active volcano very seriously. It has been going off since the middle of November, sending hot lava high into the sky. So far, no injuries have been reported. Well, I guess, you know, with Christmas and New Year's Eve around the corner, because the Mount Etna wanted to give us a bit of a, a fireworks display ahead of the time. Back to you <laughs> There you, you go. To explain the holidays, all right. Yeah. <laughs> Claudia, Thanks, thank Claudia. you so much. Welcome back. Well, this morning, the nation's air traffic controllers are in the spotlight after a New York Times report highlighted overworked and exhausted controllers. Some claim that colleagues have even used drugs and alcohol, falling asleep sometimes on the job. NBC News aviation correspondent Tom Costello joins us now with more on this. Tom, I know you have been reporting for years about the shortage of controllers. What can you tell us now about new information in this report? 
Yeah, that's right. So listen, air traffic controllers nationwide, they are understaffed and they're overworked. Mandatory overtime, six-day weeks, 10-hour days, even as we hit record volume on passengers. There is a self-reporting mechanism that controllers can turn to to report when they've made a mistake, maybe a close call. But now some controllers are reporting that they have self-medicated, substance abuse, even falling asleep on the job. It's a high-stakes, high-pressure job. And 2023 has been a year of close calls involving both pilot and controller error, including this one in Austin when a controller cleared a FedEx plane to land just as a Southwest plane was departing. Southwest aboard. FedEx is on the go. One big problem, controller fatigue. 77% of air traffic control facilities are understaffed, leading to mandatory overtime. Medical issues forced Neil Burke to retire this year. We're tired of working six days a week. We're tired of working 10 hour days. NBC News has obtained internal FAA documents first reported by the New York Times, detailing controllers' own anonymous reporting of mistakes and exhaustion. Among the entries, many employees can be observed sleeping on the job. If I had not been fatigued, I may have been able to recognize the aircraft lined up for the incorrect runway sooner. And I pray no one dies due to controller fatigue. Also included isolated cases of controllers using alcohol and illegal drugs while on position. One claimed a colleague regularly smoked marijuana on break. Another said a controller bragged about making big money buzzed. But with more than 10,000 certified controllers on the job, the new FAA chief says substance abuse is very rare. We monitor for drug and alcohol use very closely. We have robust reporting and we follow up on every possible lead that comes in. Still, both the FAA and controllers union say overtime fatigue is real. You're missing your home life. You're missing your kid, your kids' ball games and your spouse's events. Uh, and it does have an effect. Controller Michelle Hager left last June. That is not a sustainable lifestyle to be working that hard at a job that requires so much mental focus at all times. We're working every day to make sure that the the system stays as safe as it has been for decades. We're not letting down our guard and we're working that issue hard every day. So despite hiring 1,400 controllers in 2023, guess what? Because of so many retirees, net, net, they've only got eight more controllers than they did a year ago. There are that wow. many people retiring and they are well behind. It's gonna mm. take them years because right now they're behind by, depending on the numbers you look at, 1,500 to 3,000 controllers wow. short, which means all those controllers will continue to work overtime. Guys, oh, going right. into the holidays, back to you. Wow, Tom Costello, thank you very much. We might have it easy here at 30 Rock with a perfect Christmas tree delivered right to our door every holiday season, but holiday shoppers across the country are feeling the impact of a growing Christmas tree shortage in recent years. One Chicago supplier says that they were hundreds of trees short this year compared with a normal season. NBC News correspondent Maura Barrett takes a closer look at the shortage. This was our eight to nine foot area over here. And they're all empty. This bit For 35 years, Ivy Speck has been spreading Christmas cheer, shipping in Christmas trees from a farm in North Carolina and selling them to the people of Chicago. Those are all trees. Oh but this God. year, the tall trees her customers love didn't show up. We order a couple thousand, and this year we were shorted probably 500 of those. Nine to ten footers don't even exist anymore. Eight to nines are where we got shorted. We never got any nine to tens. Couldn't even order them this year. Most Americans' trees come from Oregon, North Carolina, Michigan, Pennsylvania, Wisconsin, and Washington. But retailers like Ivy all across the country have faced a short supply the last several years. People definitely want to cut their own tree, but we just can't grow them fast enough. We open them up for the first weekend, and then pretty much by the end of that first weekend, we're closed. Why is there such a tight supply this year? The tight supply actually goes all the way back to 2008 and the recession. There was an oversupply of trees and growers were having a hard time selling them. And because of that, they didn't plant back as many trees. This tree is about seven feet tall, and that takes about 15 years to grow. So it was likely planted right around the time of the 2008 recession. Here, they sell for $200. That's double the national average of about $80 to $100 a tree. 
Sellers had to adjust for an increase in pricing due to inflation. Nearly 7 in 10 growers say it's costing them 10% more to sell their trees this year. They're a little bit more expensive, but with fuel costs and things like that, um, that's to be expected. Trees in the past five years have went up, right, like doubled from the past. So, and we just have to bring, bring that along over to the, uh, the consumer. And with less trees to choose from, Ivy says customers looking for the perfect one aren't happy. Very upset. Don't understand. They're walking out. It's even losing customers because you yes, don't have enough trees. Exactly. A lot of customers, and we're upset about that. Even so, this year there's extra excitement for live trees over artificial, which are often cheaper. It's the whole smell of the live tree in the house, it's unlike anything else. It's just Christmas. 20% of people surveyed are planning to buy a real Christmas tree for the first time. Experts say it's largely millennials, like me, excited to decorate for the holiday. Totally get that, as you can see with my tree already up. <laughs> <laughs> or young families looking to start new traditions with any tree, whether it's big or small. Merry Christmas. Merry Christmas. Thank you. See you. Maura Barrett, NBC News, Chicago. Come back, let's get to some financial news, starting with layoffs at Spotify. CNBC's Bertha Coombs has your money news for us this hour. Hey, Bertha, good morning. Hey, good morning, guys. Yeah, never great to get a pink slip, especially tough during the holidays. Folks at Spotify bracing as the company has announced today that it will cut about 17% of its workforce or about 1,500 jobs. It's the second major set of layoffs this year for the company. The music and podcast streaming services citing higher costs for this latest move. Spotify did report a profit in its latest quarter. It was helped by price hikes and growth in subscribers. Gold prices continue to shine, briefly touching an all-time high today above $2,100 an ounce. The rally in the precious metal has been fueled by bets that the Federal Reserve is done hiking interest rates and could well start cutting rates as soon as next March. Lower rates have historically fed demand for investments like gold, worries about a possible recession and other factors like uh, countries moving away from the U.S. dollar have also boosted the appeal for gold. And shares of Virgin Galactic, well, they are tumbling today. The move coming after billionaire Richard Branson ruled out putting more money into the money-losing space travel company. Branson founded Virgin Galactic back in 2004, tells the Financial Times that his business empire, well, just doesn't have the deepest pockets anymore after the pandemic, and Virgin Galactic should be able to make it on its own. Last month, the company said that it was actually cutting jobs and halting commercial flights for 18 months so that it could develop a larger craft to carry more passengers to the edge of space. So mm. it turns out even some billionaires are tightening their belts a bit. Yeah. Ooh, there you go. All right, Bertha, thank you so much. We have a first look at the shortlist for Time's Person of the Year. Every year since 1927, Time has selected the man, woman, group, or concept that had the most influence on the world during the previous 12 months, for better or for worse. This morning, today, anchor Chanel Jones has a look at the top nine names on Time's 2023 shortlist. The shortlist for Time's Person of the Year begins with a trio of world leaders. First up... King Charles III. God save the king. His crowning moment came in May, after a decades-long wait for the throne, and at a moment of change for the UK monarchy. I shall strive to follow the inspiring example I have been set. Russian President Vladimir Putin continued to wage war in Ukraine. Now in its second year after the full-scale invasion, and Chinese President Xi Jinping, who is serving an unprecedented third term and solidifying his role as one of China's most powerful and controversial leaders. Next on the short list, 2023's biggest newsmakers. Sam Altman has made countless headlines in recent weeks for getting fired and swiftly rehired as CEO of OpenAI, the company behind ChatGPT, which is leading the AI revolution. Jerome Powell, chairman of the Federal Reserve, also on the short list. Powell faced with the daunting task of managing record inflation here in the U.S. Next, the Trump prosecutors, the team that led the first ever indictment of a U.S. president in our nation's history. 
Trump is facing more than 90 charges across four separate cases. The short list now moves to Hollywood and the strikers that brought the entire industry to a standstill. Actors and screenwriters were on strike for most of the year before reaching a deal, pushing for better pay and working conditions. Also on the short list, Hollywood's newest, It Girl. Hi, Barbie. The live action movie was the highest grossing film of the year, Cold earning $1.4 billion dollars and causing an explosion of wealth, all pink everything. Then finally, Are you ready for it? global superstar Taylor Swift. The Grammy Award winner has had a monumental We're year, re-released albums, record setting streams, and her Eras tour on track to become the highest grossing global tour of all time. Our thanks to Chanel Jones. You won't have to wait long to see who is person of the year. Time will announce its pick Wednesday morning. We know who you're picking. <laughs> oh, we know who I'm picking, but also don't you think there's a really good chance. Well, it's the balance of world news and yeah. serious headlines with entertainment and what we yeah, really but we know right historically <laughs> that that doesn't mean that that person no, 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 doesn't but that's become what the person have to of the decide, year. Yeah, so we sure. will see what happens. Yeah. All right. Well, speaking of Taylor Swift, yes. it was a star-powered throwdown at Lambeau Field on Sunday. The Kansas City Chiefs traveled to Green Bay to take on the Packers in an action-packed Sunday night game. But that wasn't the only thing keeping fans occupied. Taylor Swift made her appearance along with Olympic legend Simone Biles. NBC News contributing correspondent. And Kaylee Hartung joins us now from Green Bay with a recap. Hey, Kaylee, good morning. Hey guys, good morning. Coming to Lambeau Field is a bucket list item for so many sports fans. And we talked to some Chiefs fans who drove up to 14 hours to get here. They might have left a little disappointed, but I doubt that they were disappointed by the hospitality that they received here. And this game was a thriller from kickoff to the final whistle. Star power, stepping out for primetime at Lambeau Field. Oh, there, oh, she, there is. she is! The Chiefs bringing a certain good luck charm to town. Karma's the guy on the Chiefs. Do you think Taylor Swift can help Will Travis Kelsey to another win? Maybe. Maybe. I mean, she does move mountains. You can be a Packers fan and also a Swift fan. Yes, yeah. always! <laughs> Taylor Swift fresh off Beyonce's film premiere in London making the trek to the frozen tundra, arm in arm with Patrick Mahomes wife Brittany, to cheer on Kansas City and boyfriend Travis Kelsey. But cheeseheads were looking to shake it off Earlier, with support Simone from Biles a golden girl of their own. Olympic champion Simone Biles on hand to support her husband, Packers defensive back Jonathan Owens. Show me the game day fit. You got the 34. I do have the 34. I have the Owens. What do people who have never been to Lambo before need to understand about what makes this place so special? The energy, the hype, the fans. They're ride or dies. They'll do anything. And they're so dedicated. And they're just, it's, it's such a special and a unique stadium. The superstars, just two of the more than 81,000 fans rolling in for the big Sunday night football matchup. Bucket list stadium, most iconic stadium in the NFL. To experience game day in Green Bay. <laughs> and keep the Lambeau tradition alive of selling out every home game since 1960. How much a Chiefs Kingdom turned out for this one? A lot. There's a reason it's Chiefs Kingdom. But they're going to be sad tonight after we, we win this game on them. A house divided between this husband and wife. How long have you been looking forward to this game? 12 years. <laughs> Super Bowl MVP Patrick Mahomes making his debut at Lambeau. But it was a love story for the Packers. Quarterback Jordan Love owning the night. He's got the duh, Sunday night football, man. Feels great. This is waking up off the <laughs> and guys, you couldn't have scripted this ending any better after all eyes were on Taylor and Simone. The final play, it came down to Taylor's boyfriend matched up against Simone's husband. It looked like Jonathan Owens might have shoved Travis Kelsey a little bit in the end zone. But on a Hail Mary, they don't call a flag for that. Hope there's no bad blood there, guys. Yeah. <laughs> uh, good one. <laughs> all right, so much fun. Kaylee Hartung, thank you. Well, President Joe Biden and First Lady Jill Biden hosted this year's Kennedy Center honorees at the White House on Sunday. The honorees, it's an incredible list. It includes Billy Crystal, Queen Latifah, Barry Gibb, many of them. When announcing the recipients earlier this year, the Kennedy Center's president called the group of inductees an extraordinary mix of individuals who have redefined their art forms.
Pretty cool. Yeah, I'm pretty that's sure. a great mix of people. Now I want Barry Gibb and Renee Fleming to do a duet. <laughs> there you go. <laughs> I think that'd be interesting. <laughs> All right. That's so cool. <laughs> Netflix's latest thriller, Leave the World Behind, is out in select leaders now. And just listen to who's in this star-studded cast. Julia Roberts, Mahershala Ali, Ethan Hawke, and Kevin Bacon. Yeah, what a cast. It follows what happens when a family's getaway takes an ominous turn after a cyber attack. Here's a little warning. It's not for the faint of heart. Today, anchor Hoda Kotb sat down with Julia Roberts and Mahershala Ali to talk about their biggest fans, their families, and what it was like working together on the project. Who has more Oscars? I don't know the answer. <laughs> you have more? For sure. You have, do you have two? Yes. <laughs> you have two Oscars? Yeah. Very cool. We got two Oscar winners in front of us. They are two accomplished actors who also happen to be parents. Mahershala Ali and wife Amatu Sami Kareem have a six-year-old daughter. I feel like I've always had a general sense, a good sense of the things that matter in life. But I think that it becomes more articulate when you have a child. And I think when you have a daughter specifically, you be, as a man, you see the harms of the world in neon, mm -hmm. <laughs> so to speak, because of how much girls from a very young age have to navigate to have the best chance of being in their whole full self by the time they're an adult. Julia Roberts and husband Danny Motor have three kids of their own. Your kids are in college and one's about to go off to college. Mm -hmm. So you're kind of parenting adults in a way. I parent them the same way out of the house that I parented them in the house. Which is? Which is, you know, are you getting enough sleep and you sound like you're sick and are you drinking tea yeah. and yeah. texting when you get home. We all were on a FaceTime the other day together, <laughs> all of us, and it was like, this like gift that we had yeah. these four minutes of yeah. all looking at each other and that we were all so happy to be together in that way. And I love your family. I love how you speak <laughs> about them. Every time you talk about them, I feel like you're home. Well, it all starts with Danny Motor. You mm -hmm. know, he's just really mm -hmm. our anchor and our person yeah. and in the most beautiful way, our, the captain of our ship, <laughs> you know, truly. And it's not like giving it all away to him. It's just that for me, understanding how deeply felt life could be really started with him. Wow. Get her tissue. <laughs> I love love, man. When it's yeah. real, I can feel it. I, yes. I swear, a couple of things that you guys both said, yeah. I could feel chills up and down my body. Yeah. I'm like, yeah. that. Mahershala has built an impressive list of credits in his career, but this is the we first time the two Hollywood heavyweights have worked together, starring in the apocalyptic thriller, Leave the World Behind. What yes. was the experience like, Julia, working with this man? This is the first time I've had to talk about him in front of him, so it's, it's sort of embarrassing. You know, there's just a poetry to the way that he carries himself in life and in art, in my experience. A poetry, that's a thats a beautiful way to describe you. Um, Very kind of you. How would you describe working with Julia? It's a joy, yeah. a joy. That makes all the difference in the world, enjoying who you're working with, because so much of our work has to do with, like, playing in vulnerable places. Mm -hmm. I'm so sorry to bother you that this is our house. The film is based on the 2020 novel and touches on the dark side of technology as well as racial tension in America. Well, I, look, I've been 6'2". I've been 6'2 since I was 14 years yeah. old. Dark-skinned black man, proud to be. But that comes with certain things in walking and navigating this world. And people's reaction to you is ahead of your consciousness and understanding yeah. about why they're reacting to you a certain way. A turning over of, of the ring on the subway or mm -hmm. someone crossing the street in a certain way or an extra set of questions. You walk the earth sort of defensively. And while the film can be intense, it does have its lighter moments, including a playful dance scene. But wait, the way you move? Yeah, but that song, I think we heard it enough. And speaking of music, you know I could not pass up this opportunity. This is a song um, that Jenna and I have released. Would you like to hear okay, it? Okay, yes. It's a Christmas single. Yeah, okay. It was charting. This is you. Buy a small tree like a copy for the holiday. Are you feeling it? I feel you. I feel you feeling it. Wow. How? Okay, first of all, when did you have time? We did it because we, first of all, we did it for fun, and then it, it's gonna be a every Christmas. 
<laughs> that okay. is hilarious. So this is an original song. You, you wrote it. OK. We're getting no compliments here. No, no, I'm really no, impressed. No, I'm, I'm, I'm totally I'm impressed. Like... Congratulations. Oh, yeah. Watch out, Mariah Carey. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Our thanks to Hoda Gopi for that. Leave the World Behind us in select theaters now and on Netflix starting Friday. And that song, available now, I yeah. think, uh, everywhere you stream. Uh, finally, this hour, <laughs> more holiday spirit. This time of year, many people are getting into this spirit by watching a good holiday film or even taking their love of these movies to the next level by bringing that holiday spirit to life. <laughs> In Manhattan, you'll find a bar that's already decked the halls and ceiling. Why did you decide to come here? Because I love Christmas. Miracle on 9th is a holiday pop-up bar. <laughs> the other 10 months of the year, it's known for tequila and mezcal, but today drinks are served in Christmas-themed mugs. Mariah Carey plays once an hour. It takes us four days to, you know, redecorate the entire bar, replace everything with the, the kitschiest Christmas things we can find. This year, Miracle and its counterpart, Sip and Santa, have opened nearly 200 pop-up bars nationwide. These, like, reservations came out in early October, and I was already looking at them. Christmas trees are going up faster, and Christmas tunes are hitting the charts earlier. Spending on non-gift items like clothing and decorations forecast to jump 25% this year. Being in Christmas time, like, this is, this is when we bond the most. It's as if we're yearning to live inside our favorite holiday flicks. Christmas is the greatest day in the whole wide world. Whether it's Elf, which is celebrating its 20th anniversary. Hard to believe that just two days ago, none of us even knew one another. Or newer fare offered on networks like Hallmark, Lifetime, Netflix, and more. Entertainment Weekly counted 116 new films this year. Hilton even has Hallmark Channel-inspired hotel suites. Cheers. For those who want to take the spirit and spirettes home, holiday cocktail classes are in full gear. Get up and smell. At the cocktailery in Charlotte, customers want wintry recipes like apple spiced cozy cognac, capturing that just cold enough for a scarf or reuniting with your childhood crush in your hometown feeling. We are slammed with people coming in and looking for those um, holiday flavors, cranberry, pecan, all those, you know, warm and cozy flavors. And the holiday cheer isn't just limited to land. Sometimes, as you can see here, it spreads to the water. We set sail on the Coco and Carol's cruise put on by Classic Harbor Line. Those who hopped aboard say after a stressful news year, they need a little Christmas now. Everyone's in a good mood. Everybody's happy. You're about to have time off of work. So whether you're seeking a ship or a sip, many there's no such thing as too early. Cheers. Too much. <laughs> Agree with that. So we were at that bar at 2 o'clock on a Saturday afternoon, uh, the week before Thanksgiving. And that, <laughs> it was yeah. packed. Oh, my gosh. Those so Christmas people. bars and the wait sometimes to oh, get yeah. into them if you don't have a reservation. But I love it. Yeah. It does immerse you in the whole it thing. It totally does. I mean, it's completely. And Mariah Carey, at least once an hour. Yeah. <laughs> and everyone stops it's what like they're doing cool. and sings We've been along. good, though. We've seen the Rockettes. <laughs> Oh, yeah, yeah. We're full in the yeah, spirit. No, the the Christmas tree's the lit tree, here. There's yeah. been a parade. Yay. I guess I should do my holiday shopping Holiday, now. I know. Oh, it's, <laughs> that is go. important. Yeah, All neither right. of us are good at that one on time. <laughs> That's going to do it for this hour. Morning news now. But the news continues right now. Stay with us. Thanks for watching. Stay updated about breaking news and top stories on the NBC News app or follow us on social media.